So in this podcast episode, I want to talk a little bit about automation biases. And these are the kind of statements that you see online, people throw them about on social media, and they are presented as, this thing is good, this thing is bad, but there's no nuance, there's no context around what they're saying. So as a beginner, it can be very, very hard to make sense or evaluate this. So I want to look at the automation biases and how we can deal with them. Fundamentally, anything that you read or hear about automating, treat it as though it's biased, because it is. If someone out there is saying something because they feel strongly about something, they're biased towards it. If someone is positive, then it's probably because they, or someone that they know, has had a good experience in the past of the thing that they are biased towards. And if someone is negative, then the same thing applies. Neither position is true for you until you try it. The aim is to do the things and create the environment that leads to success. But that might not happen, right? The success that someone who is positive, the environment that they created around their success, you might not be able to recreate. You might not get the same result. So when we're trying to make sense of these biases, it's really important to try and focus on the practical presentation of it rather than the theories and opinions and treat the theories and opinions with suspicion unless they are backed up with some sort of experience. So I'm going to take a couple or a few uh, biases and we'll try and explore them. We'll just ad hoc riff through some of these biases. So the first up is automating through the GUI is slow and flaky. And certainly I have seen a lot of people create automated execution through the GUI that is slow and is flaky. So they take the parts that fail, then sometimes they rerun the whole set again and different items fail. And they just aggregate it out over time because it'll probably be okay. Or they're too slow to run all the time. So then they talk about not running them at all. Or the concept that your automated GUI end-to-end -end execution framework must be fast doesn't need to be. You could have a strategy where you run it in parallel all the time. Anytime there's a change, it just kicks off an automated execution build that slowly goes through. It might not be slow that's the problem. It's just that you want it to be fast because you want it in CI because you want to do what everyone else is doing. Maybe it doesn't have to meet that need. I have also seen automated execution through the GUI that is fast and because they rely on data in the database. They find data in the database rather than creating all the time. They jump into the middle of processes because they have a, a good structure. They can um, go to particular URLs and do things in tight sequence. They're not flaky because they synchronize well. Certainly I have created automated execution that is not flaky. It synchronized very well. I don't have to amend it very much. Sometimes the synchronization I put in is more extreme than anyone else puts in, but synchronization can often slow down the test execution. So there's a risk when we do that, but it's a trade-off, right? All of these things are trade-offs. Fundamentally though, automating through the GUI, based on my experience, does not need to be slow and flaky. Another bias is that we should automate more through the API than the GUI which is great if you have an API. If you don't have an API, the option isn't open to you. What are you gonna do? You're gonna to go to the dev team and say, we need an API so that we can automate through the API and not the GUI. We need to redesign our entire application so that we can, no, you work with what you've got. You test with what you've got. You automate with the time and the constraints that you are faced with. I've seen applications that have APIs and they have GUI and the API is an entirely different path through the application than the GUI. Sometimes the GUI goes through a different entry point, but then joins up in the middle. Sometimes the API has a different entry point, joins up in the middle. Sometimes they don't. So it really depends on the technical architecture of your application. As a statement, automate more through the API than the GUI isn't a necessarily valid thing to apply to every application. We need technical knowledge to do it. We should not favor GUI above API if the GUI is using the API because 
if we automate at the API level, we're automating the same path through the application and we can probably do it with more extreme and variations of data within the same time period than if we were automating it through the GUI. And we may be able to use tools that the dev team can use more than the testing team, who knows, right? It varies, it's not an absolute. I'm not biased towards that. I do automate through the API. I do automate through the GUI. It depends what's most appropriate and we'll get with the results that I'm looking for. Code-free tools are bad. Well, they might be exactly what you need. Right? And code-free tools don't necessarily have to be expensive and commercial because there are open source code-free tools. I was particularly biased against code-free tools until I used some of them and then saw that they can be very capable at what they are doing. They require a degree of skill in order to create abstractions depending on the code free tool but it varies again that's not code free is bad without code free is good it's if you do not have any coding skills on your team then you are going to be thrown towards code free tools if you want to implement without adding any coding skills onto your project and you have choices and they're not necessarily a bad choice to me Really, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Tool X is better than Framework Y, which is better than Tool Z. Uh, Playwright is better than Cypress, is better than WebDriver. Well, it might be. It depends on your context. It depends what application you're testing. It depends what your skill sets are. It depends, it depends on a whole bunch of stuff. And there, there is no one best tool that rules them all. If you think in that way, you are going to limit your testing. When someone tells you they're using a particular tool, very often you can then identify gaps in their coverage because you know that that tool doesn't support that particular way of approaching the application. So tools themselves can impose risks if we are not aware of the underlying capabilities of the tool or how we approach it. Postman is better than insomnia. Well, they do different things. Why would it be better? Well, you can write tests in Postman. Why on earth would I want to do that? I can write, I can write tests. If I can write code, I can write tests outside Postman, but then you won't be reusing the collections that you've created in Postman. No, that's right, I won't. I'll be creating abstraction layers, which may well give me more flexibility than the collection in Postman. Postman is a good tool. Right, it's just very big for some applications. Postman is trying to implement more and more features to span the uh, coverage of what people want to do on projects within API testing. One of those is more code-based manipulation of the requests, and Postman is supporting that activity within the Postman GUI itself. I might, on some projects, view that as a risk because it is in the Postman GUI and limited by whatever libraries we can import in Postman and it may be more appropriate to do in some other ways, but it depends. I quite like using Insomnia because um, it doesn't do all the things that Postman does. So I can explore the API well in Insomnia and I'm not then tempted to keep doing everything in Insomnia because I can then do those other things, the code-based exploration, the automatic generation of requests and manipulation of the requests in a programming language. If I was using Postman, I might be tempted to put everything into Postman, which might or might not be risky. It depends on the environment we're in. It's not that one is better than the other. It's you choose when to use them. You choose what risks you're gonna introduce. You choose what constraints you're gonna have what reuse potential around the code that you write is going to have. Python is better than Java. Well, my bias is towards whatever language is used to develop the application. You use that to automate the application. If the project is split into multiple teams, such that you have people automating who are in a completely different team than the people who are building the application, then it may be appropriate to use something that is related to the skill sets for the team that are doing the automating. If you're working in an environment which has multiple projects and you want to create automated execution that spans all those projects, but those projects are written in different languages, then you've got a choice to make about which language you use. And it's not that the language itself is better than another, it's that the skill sets and experience of the people on the team is more aligned to one language than another. 
Some languages have great library support for some functionality and some don't. So you have to consider what you will have to write, what you will have to add on top. Do you have the skills for doing that or not? It's not a this language is better than this language decision. It's a whole environment and ecosystem of which the team are part, their experiences are part, and the skill sets they have are part of that decision. How easy is it to recruit more people? How easy is it to get training in that language? They all factor in to that decision. It's not as simple as a bias of Python is better than Java. So one of the things I'm really conscious of is when we are beginners in any area, it's really, really hard to distinguish between biases. It's really, really hard to debate these things. So one of the easiest ways to overcome biases or to tackle them is to know a couple of things, right? What are you trying to achieve? What outcome do you want? What are your skill level? What is your experience? What experience can you draw upon in the environment? How much time and money are you going to put into this? Are you trying to do this tactically to get a quick win? Are you doing it strategically for the long term? There's a whole bunch of factors, but if you can think about what is my outcome, what are my current constraints in terms of skill levels and experience and constraints in terms of time and money, then that will help. There's a big difference between are you trying to do continuous integration based automating or are you trying to create a small set of execution that helps you quickly find problems when an application is released into a particular environment? They are very different um, use cases, they have different outcomes. They can, depending on your approach, be done entirely different ways. You could use the same approach for it, but the skill level might only lend yourself towards doing the small execution. You may still be a beginner at certain things, attempting to do strategic continuous integration based automating when you are still learning may not be the best use of your time or the best outcome because you may need to learn more in order to do that. Unless, of course, you can bring the programmers in and they can work with you to make things more effective. Now, a lot of biases are not based on a wide range of experience or a deep experience of that particular tool set or framework or approach that they're biased towards. It might just be, on my last job, we did this and this happened. And if this happened was traumatic enough experience, then they might develop a phobia to it, which uh, results in a negative bias. Similarly, if it's a good experience, it might result in a positive bias, but it might not transfer because there's a different environment, different team, different way of working, different system, different implementation of technology, different constraints, different skills, different experience, different budgets. All of these things factor together. So always try and test people's biases. And this can be very hard when you're starting out. Imagine you don't have much experience using a particular tool or much programming experience, and you're trying to make a decision between biases like, well, should we use code or should we use the uh, robot framework? We're trying to make a decision between, well, should we use page objects or should we use the screenplay pattern? Well, you're going to have to try. Ultimately, that's the only way out of this. Try them all and keep revisiting your decision. Now, on some projects, we've run parallel experiments to try different approaches. I remember we were having discussions about page objects versus screenplay pattern. So I did an implementation of the page objects. Someone else did an implementation of screenplay pattern. We compared the approaches to see the outcome. I've seen environments where the experiments didn't take place and they end up with something that wasn't well explored or well understood and then wasn't used or was then used but then constrained them so badly in what they were doing and they couldn't get out. Because fundamentally both approaches will work fine. If you're going to do page objects, or you're going to do screenplay pattern, I have seen both work. I have seen both fail. Also bear in mind that you can implement the screenplay pattern and the screenplay pattern can be an abstraction on top of a bunch of page objects, which can open out the best potentially of both worlds. Screenplay pattern is a user focused abstraction with the tasks that they do. Page objects is a very structural and implementation based pattern, which might be appropriate for certain levels of testing. It, it depends. I've used both, they both work. It's not of this one or this one. 
It also depends what language you're using, what libraries you have access to, what experiences you have. Ultimately, whatever people out there say, as soon as you start implementing it, as soon as you start automating with it, you and your team are responsible for what happens next. Right? You can't, if things go pear-shaped later on, you can't turn around and go, well, that person wrote a blog post saying we should do this. It's not gonna cut it. At that point, you own this, you made the decision. So you better know what you're doing. So be honest with your capabilities and experience. If you're new to automating, don't immediately start down the road of strategically automating your entire system because you haven't gained the experience yet. And halfway through your strategic implementation, or probably not even halfway through, you're going to learn something that's going to invalidate or cause you to want to change things that you did at the front because that experience builds up and causes you to rework it. The more that you automate and implement if you're doing it through code, the better your coding skills will get, hopefully. Otherwise, um, you're going to build code that is going to be unmaintainable. There's a lot of knowledge to pull in. So just be honest with your capabilities and experience. Don't attempt to do what someone says in a blog post unless you are aware of the skill sets and capabilities that it's going to take to do that. Unfortunately, the best way to start with automating is to have someone who has done it before on your team. There's a danger that they come loaded with their biases and they may be building some that was good for what they did before or based on their experience or good for them, but may not be appropriate long term for your environment, for your project, for the way that you work, for the budget constraints you've got, for the skill sets, for the experience, for the training levels, for the ability to hire people. And if they're the only person working on it, there might be a danger that it doesn't transfer well or they leave as soon as um, they've built something because it's no longer interesting to them because they don't like the using of it. They like the building of this complicated framework. Who knows? It can be very hard to evaluate, particularly when you don't know. So in those circumstances, look for resources that are hands-on, showing the automated execution approach in action. Start small. Get something that works. I'm learning Python at the moment. In order to learn Python, I picked some problems I wanted to solve. I picked a Python framework called Streamlit that allows me to create a GUI very fast. I solved those problems as quickly as possible for me. I learned a lot as I did it. They were very small, very constrained problems that allowed me to learn. So then I picked another problem and I took the learnings from the last problem into this. My Python's getting better. My use of Streamlit's getting better. The benefit of Streamlit is I can also release it as I go, so I'm learning in public. But start small. Get something that works. Build on it. Don't ignore issues. This is a key thing with automating. If you are starting to automate and you go, oh, that bit is quite hard to automate. Let's do it later. You may find that later doesn't happen. Maybe your tool set that you've chosen can't automate it. Fix those issues now before they become an issue. If your tests are running flaky, figure out why and fix it because that will bite you later. It's almost guaranteed. Now, part of the problem is without experience, it can be hard to know if the issues are caused by the tooling the application that you're automating not being suitable for the tooling or your use of the tool. Perhaps you're using it badly. It can be hard to know. So it can be very tempting to ignore issues. Just run the test again, see if it passes. Repeat the failing runs until they pass. Delete the stuff that doesn't work. We'll come back to it later. If you ignore it or you don't know why and how it is going wrong, it means you don't really know what you're doing and you're automating is adding a risk into the project that could very easily bite you later. I've seen people have automated execution, which is flaky and runs flaky for years. And they're just going, well, that's a natural thing for the automated execution. Because I have done a lot of automating, I saw their problem as a synchronization problem. It's a synchronization problem because of the framework they used. So I knew we just had to figure out how to wait for particular events in that framework to stop. I then knew what to look for as a Google search and I found that someone had already solved that problem. So we added a small amount of code into their abstraction layers and the flakiness went away. Years of flakiness of issues gone 
with a couple of lines of code because someone experienced knew what they were doing, but also because I was not prepared to let them live with it. They were prepared to ignore it and live with it. And inevitably, you need to address problems with automating. It's either going to automate and automate well, or it's going to be something that is a support tool for you that you don't trust in the continuous integration process. Learn whether what you're doing is tactical or strategic. And fixing the issues is actually the best way to gain experience. It's what's going to give you the deep dive experience into the tool set that you're using, into the technology that you're automating. Because you can't very often fix those problems until you understand the deep technical details of what you're doing. Ultimately, you are responsible. So don't just accept other people's biases as fact because at some point you are going to have to justify them. And you might be able to bluff and bluster your way through it. I've seen companies that end up with really limiting frameworks and approaches because someone did exactly that. Things went wrong and someone was able to bluff and bluster their way through it, that well, this always happens, this is normal. Here are industry sources saying, we should expect this type of thing when we do it this way. It's much better to do the work, to understand the issues and own them and resolve them even if resolving them means doing the hard thing of switching to something else that is easier or more appropriate for your environment. Another thing around that is to try and keep your options open for as long as possible. Because at some point, if you're automating and you're starting to see benefit from this, you'll probably be committing strategically to a particular solution. Don't do that until you have explored other options. Because one of the best times to explore other options is just at that point where you are about to commit to something because now you've developed a lot of experience, you've developed a lot of knowledge, a lot of understanding about what works well with your chosen solution. And now is the best time to look at alternatives because you will understand them. You know how to evaluate the capabilities and the pros and cons. And you probably have enough experience to pick them up and evaluate them quickly. And if you are completely confident about the tooling and approach that you're going to commit to, great, do that. If you are in any doubt, that is the best time to do an evaluation. Doing a big evaluation earlier on is hard, which is why people end up very often with those spreadsheets filled with weightings because they don't really know how to evaluate it. They don't have enough experience to use any of the tooling or approaches, so they can't really tell them apart. So they're guessing based on probabilities and requests for answers from the tool vendors. It's all very bad. But if you can actually use it and you're an expert at something at this point and you can put all your experience in, then you can evaluate faster and better. So that's it. We are all biased. I am biased. I am biased based on my experience and what I've seen work. I try not to force my biases on other people because they may not have the same experience or set of skills in their environment to implement my biases. I try to explain how I am biased and why I am biased and why I choose to do things a certain way. But I am aware that there are alternatives and that those alternatives may be perfectly valid for other people. It takes time to gain experience. Give yourself and your project and your team and your company the time to build the experience. Be realistic. It is possible to shortcut that experience by getting people in, but that's not always an option open to people. If it's not an option that's open, then just be realistic. Work through it. Take more steps. Get it working. Evaluate. Don't skate over issues and make sure that you're achieving benefits all the time. Build up your own automation biases based on your own experience, but don't force them down other people's throats. All right, thanks very much for tuning in. My name is Alan Richardson. This is the Evil Tester Show. You can find us at eviltester.com. See you later. Subscribe. Push the like button. Do your thing. See you. Methods that... <coughs> the automation gods are angry.